I was born Jonathan Aaron Steele to the parents of William and Elizabeth Steele. I am a Leo, born under the sign of the lion. And I was raised in a lower middle class family with only one brother, Michael, whom I loved dearly. He was five years my senior. My father's nickname was Red, which I could never understand why because his hair was sandy blonde. Nevertheless, the name stuck. So when my brother was born, my father became Big Red and my brother Little Red. I should have known from the first time when I realized their special connection that I just didn't fit into my father's plans. And as I grew older, the constant comparison between my brother and myself left little doubt who was the image of perfection in my father's eye. To him, my brother could do no wrong. And I became the invisible boy, the proverbial black sheep. And I soon figured out that red and black don't mix. The beatings I received became more and more frequent to the point where I would ask my father, am I the orphan son you would never need? But oddly enough, I worshiped the ground my father walked upon. My brother and I were a strange mixture, as different as daylight and dark. Looking back, it's hard to imagine we came from the same parents. And I sometimes wondered if we had the same father but I always dismissed that idea as my mother was far too religious, and my father as well, to ever even think of such a thing. But my brother, who had always sensed my parent instilled insecurities, tried his best to encourage me, for I was different and he knew it. He often told me when I was born, an angel flew over my bed and christened me with a magic wand and said, you shall be the one and I had no idea what the one was. But as I grew older, I began to understand. Most boys put their mother on a pedestal and worshiped them like the Virgin Mary. But with her too, my relationship was different and not for the good. She was opinionated, uneducated, sometimes prejudiced, overbearing, believed everything she read true or not, and when it came to religion was overzealous to say the least, a mind-boggling combination, but she was pretty, very pretty, and I would often wonder, bordering on complete confusion, how a person of this description could rationalize life. This was a series of characteristics that Many times in my life I would look back on in bewilderment, and the women I sought after when I was older would be nothing like her. In the pain of youth, the misery of my neglect would manifest itself in many ways. Depression, my enemy, fear, my friend, hatred, my lover, and anger, fuel for my fire. These four characteristics of my personality would become the guiding force in my life and would control everything I did or was to become. I shall explain later in the story about them, which I call my four doors of doom. The mirror, the great plaything for man's vanity. The mirror was to become at times my altar of refuge, and at others, my alter ego, and its magnificent obsession with the relentless pursuit of attention. It served as a chilling reflection of my own wretchedness and my greatness. It was the one place I could go to see inside myself, to find love in an otherwise loveless household where I could be great, 
where I could be anything or anyone I wanted to be. 100% pure escapism until I discovered its precious secret. It has a personality all its own. It is a genie that grants all the wishes you could ever dream. At least in my case. All except two. It was my 14th birthday. The day that changed my life forever. My brother Michael. The one person who was my guiding light. My friend. My hero was killed by a drunk driver in a head-on collision. He died instantly. I couldn't even bring myself to go to his funeral. My agony was so great, I just couldn't come face to face with him that one last time. My failure to attend intensified my parents' resentment for me even more. But from that moment on, nothing seemed to matter. Especially that living hell called home. For one year after his death, I roamed the streets in a fog, barely conscious of anything or anyone, and I discovered alcohol, and girls, and drugs, and in general, a life I'd never known, which was exciting, frightening, and wonderfully dangerous. And it was then, as I staggered through a downtown city street in one of my drunken rages, I stumbled across a small music shop, and in the window there stood the instrument, the fiery tool that would become the object of my newfound desire, the instrument of my passion, my obsession, the blood red six string. It was like I'd known the thing all my life. I soon found it was the only way I could truly express myself. It was a way to vent all my frustrations, all my pain, completely open all my four doors of doom, and I found myself going to the mirror for counsel, less and less. Because of this, my songs seemed to write themselves and I knew my destiny was in my music, but I was going to have to get out of this backwards town I was in, if I was ever going to succeed. And I was 16 going nowhere. And the only thing my parents knew was live, work, die. And if I stayed there, that's exactly what was going to happen to me. I was going to die. So I ran away to the big city where the lights, the excitement, the danger, and a chance for me to finally live and to do my music without the persecution I had known for so long. I hitchhiked all the way with a suitcase in one hand and my guitar on the other. And as I stood at the edge of the city, the magic of the place was incredibly intense. It was to be my new home, the place I would call the arena of pleasure. I lived and struggled in the arena for two years, trying to get a break in the music world and make a record. And that's when I ran across a delightful businessman named Charlie. He had been a lawyer for 25 years before he discovered he could fuck over more people in the recording industry than he ever could in a court of law. And he was the president of one of the biggest record companies in the world. And the music business to Charlie was nothing more than a sacrificial lamb to be led to slaughter. And the weapon of choice was his record company that he'd wield like a mighty sword the great tool he would lovingly refer to as the chainsaw. The morgue, Charlie said, was the music business, where everyone sells out, where all the artists will eventually pour themselves to commercialism, the place where the music comes to die. And through him, I learned everything I needed to know about the music business, and even things I didn't want to know. He said he could make me a star, one of the biggest things the world had ever seen. The big time was calling, and I was on my way. He introduced me to an aspiring young manager named Alex Rodman, 
And together, we took on the whole fucking world and kicked it square in the ass. Just before the release of my first album, I was sitting on the steps in front of my apartment when a gypsy woman passed by. She stopped and asked me if I'd like my fortune read, and I'd never had it done, so I was more than happy to say yes. She revealed a deck of tarot cards and began to tell me of my past, in which she went into great detail about the pain of my youth, my brother, and my parents. She saw my present, with my great struggle to succeed in the fulfillment of my dreams and newfound happiness. But after about 10 minutes, she stopped, and I wanted to know of my future and pleaded for her to go on. And finally she spoke. She showed me a very disturbing vision of where I was going. I told her I wanted phenomenal wealth and fame. And in the cards, she saw a fallen hero and looked at me and said, Be careful what you wish for. It might come true. For the face of death wears the mask of the King of Mercy. I asked her if she was sure of what she had seen, and with a blank stare, she turned and walked away, leaving me with the cards and a haunting that would follow me the rest of my life. Success agreed with me with amazing ease. And the more records I sold, the more excess I had of everything. Friends, money, women, cars, houses. It was at one of my nightly hedonisms, a rather flash individual entered the room. He introduced himself as the doctor. I asked him what kind of doctor, and he smiled and said, Meet my friend, Uncle Slam. The mirror that was once on the wall, my alter ego, was now talking to me from the table. And the next three years were a blur. Drugs became the new candy, and alcohol became the new Coca Cola. And Dr. Rockter was my new best friend. I never heard the mirror speak again until tonight. I was at the peak of my career, and the world saw me as I had always wanted the idol, the great Crimson Idol. Now I had everything, it seemed. Everything but the one thing that would have meant more to me than anything the pain that manifests itself into my obsession. The acceptance of me by my mother and father, who I had not spoken to since I had left home. And one morning, my manager, Alex, came in and broke up one of our nightly Easy Rider parties. And an Easy Rider party was when everybody would come over to my house the band, the doctor, hot and cold running women, etc. And we'd watch the movie and do everything going on in the film. Only a lot more. And he threatened to leave me if I didn't clean up. It was not that he cared about me as a person. He was only interested in the talent and what it could do for further his own career as a true showbiz mogul. But it was then I realized just how far things had gone. So I sat there, alone, in my palace of pain. And I was numb from the alcohol and the drugs, but equally as intoxicated by my own fame. And I had just enough courage to pick up the phone. I dialed the number. My mind went into a whirlwind, thinking of what would happen. And the fear overcame me and I started to put down the phone, but before I could, a voice on the other end rang out and it sent a chill through me I'd never know. It was my mother. It was hard for me to speak. My heart was pounding out of my chest. But when I did, I did the best I could. She was very cold. But I knew the shock of suddenly hearing from me after all these years was overwhelming. And I was hoping that 
All the time that had passed would heal the deep wounds between my parents and me, but I desperately wanted them to approve of me, to accept me. It was all I ever wanted. I hoped my success would finally prove my worthiness and they'd welcome the prodigal son home. All I wanted was for them to be proud of me. But less than 50 words were spoken. The last four were, we have no son. Some wounds never heal. Mine, it scarred me for life. A great star fell from the sky that night, and with its descent, left a scorched path on its way. A great path of self-destruction. Burning out. And on this night, the great finale is finally here. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs>